All right, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to In the Fighting Chair. This is our live broadcast streaming from Living Sharks Museum in Westerly, Rhode Island. My name is Keith and I'm the curator of Living Sharks Museum. We are what we like to call America's first shark history museum. Uh, we've got artifacts here from all over the world telling the story of the shark. And as an extension to that, we've created In the Fighting Chair as an opportunity to uh, speak with folks who are working currently in the world of sharks, be it entertainment or science or conservation. And today, I am very lucky to be able to have a, a, a very fun conversation, I'm sure it will be, uh, with the well-known uh, Dr. Greg Skoll uh, from Mass Marine Fisheries and Atlantic White Shark Conservancy. Now let's bring on Dr. Greg. Hello, Thank you. Greg. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good. How are you faring this time period? Oh, we're doing all right. You know, hunkered down in the house with a bunch of kids running around and uh, trying to get some work done. But, you know, it's working. We're getting it done. You know, we're, we're doing our part. That's excellent. Well, I really appreciate you coming on live for us and My chatting a little bit about sharks. And, and we're actually going to go back in time a little bit and Hopefully you'll be uh, willing and able to share uh, a little bit about your beginnings, the, the time of uh, working with sharks. Uh, where are you originally from, Greg? I'm, uh, I'm from Southern Connecticut. So, you know, that stretch of, uh, of I-95 that's backed up with traffic all the time now between New Haven and New York. Um, I was born in Stamford, Connecticut and grew up in, in Fairfield County. So, um, yeah, I, I grew up on uh, Long Island Sound. Okay, but you ended up going to school at URI? Yeah, yeah. I, um, I kind of fell in love in the, with the ocean by, uh, by watching it on TV. And, and I, I try not to tell too many kids that these days because we're trying to reduce screen time. But, um, you know, a lot of uh, what I was fascinated with, I saw through the eyes of uh, guys like Jacques Cousteau and movies like Jaws and The Deep and Blue Water, White Death. And, and so I decided pretty much when I was in high school that it would be really cool to become a, a marine biologist. And uh, I picked the University of Rhode Island and they I got really lucky. They accepted me and I spent four years there on my undergrad and went back for my master's degree at the University of Rhode Island. So I spent a bunch of time in Rhode Island and uh, really grew to love that state and, uh, and that school. As you know, we're very lucky to live in westerly Rhode Island, right here on the coast. Uh, I grew up on the coast as well, so I've definitely had that attraction to the ocean and the marine life. I never got to go to school, so I had to get really creative to get involved. Yeah. Um, so this is an honor to be able to chat with you. Of course, we've met a, a few times now, and uh, this will be uh, a much more lengthy conversation. <laughs> Well, well, it's great to be visiting with you. It's, um, you know, we have chatted a few times. I love the fact that you've established your organization and the museum. And I, uh, we were just talking about it. But as soon as the dust settles and thing, the air clears, so to speak, I'm going to come down and visit the museum. I can't wait. Well, thank you. Well, when did you decide that it was going to be sharks? I know it's all part of that, that, that early viewing experience I had as a kid. I mean, all kids, in my mind, are, are, from what I can tell, fascinated by sharks and, and dinosaurs and creatures like that. And I, I guess I never really outgrew that fascination with sharks. And, um, you know, again, it was movies like, you know, Jaws and Blue Water, White Death and, and books about sharks and uh, that, you know, I just, I just think they're really, really cool animals. And, um, decided that this was something, if I ever got the chance to study them, I thought I'd be the absolutely luckiest guy in the world. So um, I guess I'm a really lucky guy. <laughs> I think most of the world would say so. Uh, <laughs> you've, you've definitely embodied that idol of yours, uh, Mr. Matt Hooper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, uh, that character in the film just, in my opinion, had the best job. And so, um, I'm I'm a really lucky guy to be able to follow his footsteps and do very similar things. Now, when you first started working with sharks, um, 
there had already been a tagging program in place at that point because um, Dr. Uh, Mr. Jack Casey started the tagging program in Rhode Island, or originally in New Jersey, I believe. Um, and they were roto tagging sharks um, and eventually M tagging sharks around the days of, or the heyday, I should say, of Captain Frank Mundus. Uh, when did you get to tag your first shark? And what form of tag was it? <laughs> yeah, it was. Um... Yeah, that was a great experience. I was I was at the University of Rhode Island in, in my uh, in my junior year, my third year, um, and uh, Jack's program advertised for a seasonal technician. And this is a great story because it starts with failure. Um, but so I but I applied for this seasonal technician job working for the shark tagging program in Narragansett, Rhode Island, and I didn't get the job. Um, <laughs> But I, I have also applied for a, a, another computer technician job at the same facility, and I got that one. And so I ended up working at the lab this, that summer, which was 1982. And, and uh, I was so fascinated by Jack's work with sharks that um, I volunteered for Jack's project. And, uh, and then my time came in, in November of 82 when, when uh, I was working for uh, one of Jack's top guys, uh, a guy by the name of Wes Pratt. And, and Wes is a world famous shark scientist, really an amazing scientist. And I was, I was volunteering for him and he offered me the same job that I had originally applied for months earlier. I guess whoever they hired didn't work out. And so I started working for Wes Pratt in November of 1982. I ended up graduating from uh, University of Rhode Island in 1983, so this is a long time ago. Gives you a sense of how old I am. Um, but I really didn't get to tag my first shark until a couple of years later because I was just a young punk, you know, working at th this lab trying to absorb as much information as I can. And the, and, the, and, the, and the folks who were doing the tagging were the real professionals. I was helping them any way I could, you know, handing them tags or writing down data, going out on the research cruises with them maybe helping them wrangle the shark a little bit. But I didn't actually get to tag uh, uh, my first sharks until a couple of years later. And I, we were using those original M tags, the streamer tags, this is what we typically call a spaghetti tag. And those are simple conventional tags and they work well. And, you know, and, and Jack's program, Jack's now retired and um, his program passed on to Dr. Nancy Kohler and she was a brilliant scientist and she just retired you know, last year. So, um, but they've tagged, you know, hundreds of thousands of sharks now over the years. And a lot of those fish are tagged by cooperative fishermen. So it's really, you know, the fishing public that has made that research possible. And it was really where I kicked off my career. And I must say, I'm great, a lot of gratitude to that project for teaching me how to, go, to be a scientist. Now, are you also a diver? Yeah, I, I started diving in 1978, 1978, so I was pretty young back then. But again, it was this whole, you know, Jacques Cousteau and, and Peter Gimble and these, these pioneers in diving that got me so interested in the ocean and being in the water. And, um, yeah, so I've been diving a long time and um, I absolutely love it. I, I don't get to dive as much as I would, I used to, but, uh, you know, I, you know, maybe after I retire, I'll spend a little more time in the water as opposed to on it. <laughs> um, of course, you got some time in the water in Shark Vortex, which played over the course of this weekend. Yeah, Shark Vortex. I worked with uh, Joe Romero on that film project, and that was that was fun. We got some time in the water with blue sharks, and you know, and I really liked the film because it talked about you know the the incredible seasonality and productivity of of New England and the shark species that we attract here, and uh, and and some of the work we're doing, and, and and the fascinating aspects of those the lives of those animals, and the poor beagle as well. Yeah, the poor beagle shark. We did a bunch of work with poor beagles over the years, but I got to hang out with my my friend uh, James Sulakowski, who's been doing poor beagle work now for many years, and. Uh, you know, just being able to see one of those fish is, is a good day as far as I'm concerned. Yes. <laughs> the phantom, they call it. That's uh, it's yeah. an amazing shark. We started calling him the phantom shark in that film, and that was kind of fun. 
<laughs> I like that. It's a good, good description, especially for for our waters. Um, I finally got a chance to see my first poor beagle. Unfortunately, it was deceased in uh, Dr. Natanson's lab, um, but I learned a lot about it uh, from the inside out. <laughs> oh yeah, Lisa, as good as it gets. As as you know, Lisa, another great shark scientist. There's rumors she might retire soon. But uh, and that's going to be another great loss to the community in terms of you know her her talent. But she'll you know she'll still be around doing work. But she she knows the she knows sharks inside and out. You know, and a great necropsy scientist and um, a good friend. Well, that's what I hope this project will be able to um, you know make good use of is the just the depth of knowledge that all of you have um, as you transition out of shark science formally. Um, not yourself, of course, I'm sure. <laughs> we'll be uh, having this conversation many times over the years to come. Uh, but it's a very exciting time, uh, definitely a transitional time uh, with so many pushes for conservation uh, and so many different organizations kind of, well, we'll say attacking that uh, debate in, in different ways. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Tagging technology, though, uh, were you involved directly in the begin the early days of tagging technology? Well, you know, I was only to the extent that I've taken advantage of the new technologies. You know, the um, you know the, there are some pioneers in tag technology that have been instrumental in making sure that um, well, just just with the beginnings of, for example, acoustic technology. You know. Grip, a great scientist from the past, uh, the late, you know, Dr. Frank Carey, um, he used to build the acoustic tags in his lab, you know, and he'd pot them and, and uh, design them. He did everything with them. And, and then he'd go out and put them on a shark and follow it around for a few days. And, and you know, I got a chance to, to get to know Frank quite well and work with him on research cruises. And he, he really was a pioneer that bridged the gap between engineers and and uh, and biologists and um he was a bit of both and was able to to not only think you know think in terms of how do, how do we advance technology to study these animals but how do we you know uh, build these tags and actually do it and he did that and a lot of his early work you know ended up being used by some of the manufacturers that are around today um you know in terms of just improving upon that technology. And of course, with the explosion in satellite technology and, and then circuitry and batteries, you know, everything just took off, you know, I want to say over the last two decades, you know, and so the early efforts of, of Frank Carey, which really go back to the late 60s through the 70s and early 80s, you know, those, those uh, principles and techniques have now been carried forward using the newer satellite technologies. And I've been around long enough now to say, hey, that's a really cool tag. I want to try it out. And, and I'm, I'm also able now to work with some of these companies and tell them how I think the, you know, it can be improved. You know, I'm no engineer, but I, I found myself totally reliant on engineers and um, in order to do the kinds of science that we're able to do today. So it's, it's just been a fun time to live you know, having, you know, gone from the age of not having computers to now being able to, to actually put them on fish. And that, I think that's absolutely amazing. Before this time, uh, I guess studying the life history of sharks was relatively reliant on, on fishermen and their observations. And then of course, uh, the sharks that came back to the docks, uh, either commercially, recreationally or via tournament. Uh, but I mean, that, that was a resource, right? Yeah, yeah. We we um we still you know I still in my you know the first couple of decades of my career, you know I I learned so much from working with and around fishermen. You know, these are folks that have been on the water, you know, for their their most of their lives. They know these fish. They know where they are. They know a lot about their biology. You know, obviously, they know how to target them, and in many cases, they know how to avoid them. And you know, so this is this is just you know, that's just so much wealth of knowledge 
and um, that I've tapped into over the course of my career and continue to do that, you know, even on how to apply a tag or where to find these fish so we can tag them, or what's the pro proper tagging platform. All those, all that information comes at least over the course of my career from fishermen, you know, and, and I've learned a lot from them, you know, and, and we still sample. If there's a fishing tournament, we'll go and learn from those fish that come in. And as long as those, those, those fish are, you know, harvested legally using the, the very conservation based regulations that we have here in the United States, I'm fine with attending those events and learning from them. And uh, we've learned a lot. Uh, from those sharks, and yeah, you know, I've transitioned over the years from studying dead fish to studying live fish, but I still never let a good a dead fish go to waste. You know, we, we try to learn from it, and uh, and nowadays fishermen don't harvest these animals unless they're 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 consumed and utilized. So you know, we've come a long way over the years. But I I got to tell you, I, I I have a lot of gratitude toward the fishing, you know, the commercial and recreational fishing public because they have been very helpful for me. Now, is there a clear line where that we could draw between a time period when sh sharks were not really being consumed uh, on the eastern seaboard and, and when they started to be consumed? Yeah, I mean, um, absolutely. I mean, we can look chronologically at, uh, at the development of, of, of shark fisheries, both commercial and recreational. I think that the movie Jaws and the character of Quint, which is, you know, he was modeled after Frank Mundus, who was around in the 70s. Um, and really, with, the, with Jaws came the explosion of recreational interests in going out and catching sharks. And, and, and that, that also coincided with the explosion in shark fishing tournaments. And I will say a lot of those sharks that were brought in during those events through the 70s and into the 80s, even the early 90s, a lot, many of them weren't utilized in any way, which is which is sad. So it was a horrible, horrible waste. Um, but as you know, also during this period, particularly during the 80s, um, we saw uh, m massive declines in some of our more marketable groundfish species, you know, namely cod and haddock and yellowtail flounders and a lot of the species that were commercial fishermen relied upon. And so sharks were considered by the U.S. government and others as being underutilized. So we saw this, this expansion in commercial fishing targeting shark species as well. And, and that also coincided with the explosion in the, in the, the Asian um, shark fin trade, uh, which you know, basically put real value on, on the heads, of, namely the fins of sharks. And so we saw this rapid expansion in the 80s that occurred with commercial fisheries targeting sharks. Um, and, and frankly, the U.S. government and the states all had to back up and figure out how to get management and conservation in place, not knowing much about these species. And so the first you know, fisheries management plan in the U.S. You know, happened around 1993, I believe. Um, but that was after these fisheries had already likely driven many of the shark species down pretty hard. And so we had to really um, buckle down on these fisheries and, and unfortunately put a lot of people out of business in order to bring those shark populations back. And at the same time, the recreational sector started realizing that, you know, why are we killing sharks if we're not going to use them? And so many of the tournaments converted over to species like mago, mako and horb eagles, threat good eating edible species, and at the same time following all the regulatory uh, management practices that had put, been put in place. So we have an interesting history in sharks from an exploitation point of view here in the U.S., but I think managing shark species and bringing them back. You got me? Yeah, I think we're we're experiencing some delays Tech via StreamYard. I'm sure lots of people are streaming today. Yeah, probably. Um, but I hope you caught most of that because I tend to talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely caught it. Uh, so what were you doing in 2014 when Gretel emerged <laughs> mysteriously? 
Yeah, Gretel. Gretel's probably the first, uh, really the first white shark that we put, uh, you know, a uh, more sophisticated electronic tag into in, in the uh, in Massachusetts. Actually, in the Atlantic, it was um, quite the experience. You know, uh, for those who don't remember the story of Gretel, it was a, a really beautiful 14-foot white shark, female white shark that swam and got trapped in a, a salt pond. Uh, on the Elizabeth Islands, um, southwest uh, of, of Woods Hole, Massachusetts, Cape Cod. And uh, she became entrapped in there for about two weeks. And so we tagged her. And uh, it was really my first up close and personal experience with a live white shark over multiple days. And uh, it was really a, um, an indication of what was to become. The, the norm here in Massachusetts and Cape Cod. Um, but it was quite the experience. We ultimately did get her out of the pond, but it was, uh, it was quite, quite an event, uh, you know, professionally, you know, <laughs> physically, emotionally, psychologically, you name it. The Gretel was an amazing fish. Now you had to utilize all different types of methods and madness to try to coax Gretel out of you know, that area and back into the sea. Um, when I heard you tell this story recently uh, at Boston Sea Rovers, you mentioned uh, that one of the things you tried utilizing was the shark shield. Uh, of course, we have one of those in the museum. Uh, this is the sea change version of the shark shield, which of course now Ocean Guardian has. Uh, what did that apparatus look like? Did you literally use a few of these shark shields in the water and try to coax her out yeah so you know just just to set the stage a little bit the um you got to think of this shark as swimming into a bowl that was about 20 feet deep but to get in the bowl and we know how she got in it we don't have any idea but she got over the rim of the, the bowl which is about three or four feet deep and so she got over the rim of the bowl through this inlet into this into this deep pond and she wouldn't leave so we had to try to figure out how to get her out of there. And one of the things we did was we tried to bait her and then that didn't work. We tried to generate all kinds of noise and spook her out and that didn't work. We tried a silt fence, you know, putting all kinds of um, suspended silt in the water, to try to get her to move out in the right direction. And that didn't work. We tried a number of things and we finally tried the shark shield, which were uh, just like the model you were holding up, Keith, but it was about six feet long. So we strung three of those together in a line, uh, on, a, on a line, and, and uh, suspended them between two boats, and then uh, tried to force her in the direction that we wanted her to go in. And um, when, she first re when she first felt the electrical field, and that's what these things do, they generate a really powerful electrical field. And that electrical field is thought to be uncomfortable for the electrosensory organs, which are on the nose and the face of the shark, and they overwhelm it. So think of it, you know, kind of like shining a bright, really bright light into our eyes. We, we turn away. Um, so imagine this electrical field forcing the shark to turn away, and the, it re, the shark really did react to it. You know, it jumped and uh, it went crazy, and we thought, well, this is it. It's going to absolutely work, and so we started forcing the shark in the direction we wanted her to go in. And then she turned around and said, no, I don't want to go that way and came right back toward the boats and right into that electrical field and swam right through it, not really caring at all. So she became really acclimated to the electrical field very quickly. So it worked once, but it didn't work after that, unfortunately. And, and ultimately that wasn't the solution to our problem. So around that time, what, what was the seal population like in Cape Cod? Well, you know, you have to look at the, when we look at the history of the seals on Cape Cod, or you, you got to look at the history of the seal populations off the Northeastern U.S. and Canada in general. And, um, you know, we really, we being humans, uh, drove um, the seals to the brink of extinction, all, all seal populations, including the gray seal, um, really many, many, many years ago, on the order of hundreds of years ago. And so for those people who are older, 
and don't remember seals around, it's because we did a lot of damage to those populations long before um, you know many of us were alive. Um, but in 1972, we passed the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and we've seen seal populations respond. Although it took a long time for them to respond, it's taken almost 50 years. And so, you know, slowly the seal populations have been coming back. So in 2014, in 2004, when Gretel swam into that pond, you know, we had been seeing more and more seals around. Um, and certainly the population has been growing even since then. That was 15, 16 years ago. And so you know, we have seen, you know, steady increase in seal populations off the northeastern U.S. And that in and of itself, we think, we firmly believe, is drawing these white sharks close to the shore to feed on those seals. And that, of course, has afforded us the opportunity to now uh, tag over 200 white sharks using a variety of, of the new technologies, including, you know, the satellite-based and acoustic technologies. Now, you're working with uh, Captain Chip in South Carolina, right? He's applying some of that satellite technology. Yeah, yeah. So not we're not only tagging, you know, white sharks off of uh, the coast of, of Massachusetts and specifically, you know, Cape Cod, but also we're we're working with uh, Captain Chick, you know, Michael Love down off of uh, of Outcast Charters, down off of uh, South Carolina, where he's deploying these tags on white sharks down there during the, the winter months. And these sharks are overwinter down off the southeastern U.S. So we're taking advantage of the opportunity working with him to get these tags out on, on those animals down there. And he, and it's, uh, it's worked out really well, you know, you know, having, you know, we have 230, you know, sharks tagged total. And, and many of those, you know, uh, are also, some of those have also gone out off of South Carolina. Now, I know OSEARCH uses the term NASFA. Is that a generally accepted term? Uh, and is that why you're satellite tagging in South Carolina? Because you believe that there is a, a shared foraging area there? No, I mean, if you can, people make up all kinds of terms for these things. That one uh, is not particularly catching on. We wrote a paper um, in 2017 that described uh, the southeastern U.S and the Gulf of Mexico as the overwintering habitat for the white sharks. So it's it's pretty well described. It's it's also been um, you know, historically known because of capture data for white sharks that dates back to the early 1800s. If you look at all the, the sightings and capture data for white sharks going back that far, we can see that during the winter months, they primarily, primarily stay off of the southern states from North Carolina south into the Gulf of Mexico. And then they uh, they migrate north. So their range expands latitudinally as the temperatures warm up in the in the late spring into the summer. And then uh, where they remain in the northern latitudes off of New England, Gulf of Maine, into Canadian waters, right through into November. And then they migrate south again to the southern areas. So it's a it's a fairly um, interesting but um simple migratory pattern that most of the sharks show you know along the eastern seaboard of the united states the white sharks um, but every now and then what's really interesting is some of these sharks will go out into the mid-atlantic and have all what we call a pelagic slave um, that they go into and we don't know why they do this we presume that they're foraging but it certainly could be related to reproduction and when they go out into the open atlantic they're diving down to lengths, to, to depths as, as, as great as, you know, a thousand meters, you know, so in excess of, you know, 3,000 feet, you know, every day, which is absolutely remarkable. And it's a real testament to the fact that this new technology is, is teaching us things about these sharks that we never knew before. You know, based on all our data prior to that, we thought that this was a coastal shark. Uh, but we're finding that many coastal species actually have an oceanic phase when they go into what we call mesopelagic depths and those are in depths in excess of two, 200 meters deep now is there any indication of an area congruent with the concept of the white shark cafe in the pacific no it's a great question keith you know something we've been looking 
at specifically. You know, the the uh, the White Shark Cafe in the Pacific is a, is a focal. We refer to it as a focal area that that all the the sub adult and adult white sharks go to uh, from the uh, um, the coast of California and Mexico. And so those sharks are going there, and it's you know it, it's methodical. It, you could you, you could set your watch by it, um, but it's a fairly sizable area. It's a big area, um, but it is a focal area. It's, uh, but here on the East Coast, when we tag our sharks, whether we tag them off the Southern U.S. or we tag them off of the Northeastern U.S., they don't go to any particular focal area. They seem to have a much more nomadic. Uh, existence, where their migration, their movement are almost random. One of the sharks moved out to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Others move out to the shelf edge. Um, but it seems to be, you know, less focused on any particular area like it is in the um, in the in the eastern North Pacific. Do you think it's because of uh, the stream actions? Um, it's like the Gulf Stream and the two currents coming together. Is that a barrier and maybe kind of keeping these species closer to the coast where they don't need to converge in one area for the unknown reason like the cafe? Yeah, good question. I, you know, it's, it, we don't know. We, we've published a couple papers with uh, Cameron Braun and others and Peter Gobb from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and elsewhere. And they... You know, we, we, we definitely know that a lot of shark species, including white sharks, will take advantage of, of mesoscale oceanography, oceanographic processes. So all I'm really referring to is if you look at any ocean and you look at it at a, at a finer scale than just at an oceanic scale, you can see there's actual structure in the ocean. And I'm not just talking about the bottom and the surface. I'm talking about you know, changes in the oceanography driven by currents and streams like the Gulf Stream. And, and what you get is what we call small scale or mesoscale eddies, eddy systems, like circulation patterns. And a lot of species of sharks will, will take advantage of these uh, mesoscale eddy systems and uh, in order to forage within them, because they tend to concentrate other species of animals, like fish species. Um, and they'll take advantage of that. And some of these have warm cores, others have cold cores. And so there's so much oceanography out there and we don't tend to think of it because we tend to think of the ocean as a homogeneous mass and it's not. So when we talk about movements of animals off the Northeastern US, we do want to think about you know, the Gulf Stream. We want to think about you know, major current systems and eddy systems and the way that they help motivate what these animals do and the structure they provide in terms of temperature and water densities and oxygen layers and you name it. And so, you know, one of the aspects of our work, you know, as biologists is to work with oceanographers, physical oceanographers, uh, in order to get a, be able to better interpret, you know, what we're finding with these fish. You know, it, it's one thing to say, well, they go here and they go there. It's another thing to try to get a sense of why they go there and what they're doing when they get there. And, and that's been a major focus of, of marine scientists in recent years. You know, and, and it means biologists getting together with, with oceanographers and you know, getting together with engineers and having you know, that holistic approach to studying the behavior of these animals. How, how much more uh, satellite tagging do you think is required and when do we get to a point where we need to look for a new technology what might that new technology be well we're, we're always we're always hungry for new technologies right um you know and, and and there are a bunch out there you know and and you know the satellite linkages are a great way to get data back um you know and but now many of us as I just kind of alluded to, we're, we're very much interested in not just knowing where these animals are going, but what they're actually doing, you know, when they get there. So a lot of scientists are, are going down the road of looking at really fine scale behavior using acceleration data loggers, you know, the kinds of 
data logging tags that give you the three-dimensional movement of these animals over a very fine scale. You know, tags that are measuring, you know, the posture, the turning angles, the acceleration of these sharks, you know, 10 or 20 times a second. So you can get a sense of what is that shark doing? How is it swimming relative to its depth? All those kinds of things. And and there's still, in some cases, satellite linked. Um, but we're also trying to couple that with new camera technology. So we can say, well, we know from the data that the shark turned really hard to the right and accelerated, you know, increasing its speed dramatically. But why did it do that? Well, the camera on the tag told us that it was chasing a seal. And so we're coupling this really fine scale data technology and archival tagging systems with with cameras. And so that's that's the wave of the future. And you know, now the setbacks to those tags is that they only have so much battery, they only have so much bandwidth. A lot of that information can't come back through satellites. So you have to go out and get the tags. Uh, but that's what we're doing now, and that's what a number of, of scientists are doing. So we're forever looking for the the new technologies, but they're out there and they're getting better and better every year. You know, Shark Cam. Shark Cam's another great example of of technology we started using a few years ago with my colleagues from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. You know, uh, an underwater drone system that could follow a shark and actually film it and record what it's doing. I mean, 10 years ago, that's crazy to think of doing, and we did it. We did it on white sharks. We did it on, on, on bull sharks, and, uh, and, we're, and that technology is going to keep taking off, you know, and, um, and I love it. You know, again, I said it before, it's a really great time to be alive and to be a scientist because this technology is just, you know, exploding. Something I want our viewers to really understand is something that you've told a lot of people, um, even myself, in, in past years. Uh, they, you're really only scratching the surface of shark science, especially white shark science. Um, so that's why I, I like to talk about emerging technologies and uh, what our viewers, uh, folks who are going to school now or considering going to school, uh, the young kids, what can they bring to the table? What are the needs? Uh, so you know, the limitations of the current technology, it sounds like the battery power, uh, the storage capacity, and the ability to uh, send that information to the satellite, um, and a lot of the technology we, we have right now that uh, you were just talking about is relatively short-term. Uh, the use is short-term. Yeah. I, I, I talk a lot with um, – well, every now and then I'll give a talk to high school students and, and – um, and I talk a lot with college students, as you can imagine. But you know, when you you know, they might see me on TV tag a shark, um, but, you know, and it looks like it's okay, it's me and it's one or two other people. But the truth of the matter is, it, it, you know, it's it's hundreds, if not thousands, of people which have you know gone into getting me there to what I'm doing today. Whether it be the you know electrical engineers or the physicists. Or the, uh, or the or the satellite technicians, or NASA, or you name it. I mean, the person driving the boat, the person who built the boat, you know, the person who put the pulpit together, you know, the person who actually manufactured the tag, you know, the, the, the person who provided the dockage for the boat, the gasoline for the boat. I mean, so there's so many different avenues you can go down and, and be part of this research. And you may say, well, I, I'm not really interested in 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 science but i really like you know some some other aspect of what i'm doing i like to be on the water well okay you know so come on the water with us you know these big research boats that we we use we have you know people on board that are making that boat work you know make it run every day you know driving the boat you know there's literally hundreds of people behind everything we do with all different forms and facets of careers and so i i, I try to Explain that to kids, and it's only going to get better, you know, as the technology explodes and, and, and our tools, our toolbox basically becomes bigger. You know, you're probably involved in hundreds of different studies going on all over the place. Uh, you did recently just finish up your five year study, uh, the population study on the white sharks in the Cape. But you've also just begun another five year study, right? Uh, can you tell us what that might be about? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, we partnered up with uh, the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy, which is, you know, not only um, an incredible vector that supports our research and has for uh, many years, but also, you know, one of their scientists, Megan Winton, works with me, you know, every day, and and she brings so much to the table. Um, that I'd be lost really without her help and without the backing of the conservancy. And so, you know, the population work is part of her PhD dissertation at the University of Massachusetts School for Marine Science and Technology. Um, and as she's, you know, we've wrapped up our field component to that and we're you know, doing the analytical work right now and that's gonna take another few months. Um, but we've also embarked on, as you alluded to, a new study where we're going to be um, spending far more time drilling deeper into how white sharks behave when they're around Cape Cod over very fine scales. And it, it really is to get a better sense of how, when, where, you know, white sharks attack and kill their prey. And we think being able to better understand that will provide us with information that, that might be useful for, you know, protecting swimmers at beaches and snorkers and kayakers and paddleboarders, you know. It's, it's no secret that the presence of white sharks off the case, Cape, coast of Cape Cod, which is a very, very popular place to be, um, presents somewhat of a danger, you know, to swimmers and, and other recreational users and stakeholders. You know, indeed, we had a couple of attacks in 2018, and unfortunately, you know, one of those was fatal. And so the better we understand these fine scale behaviors and then really specifically the predator prey behavior of white sharks around Cape Cod. And if we can find any patterns to that behavior and predictability to that behavior, we'll be able to, I think, better inform beach managers on how to enhance public safety. So that's really been a, uh, the focus of our work starting in 19 and hopefully for the next few years to come as we we seek out uh, how these animals live, you know, not only week to week, but day to day, hour to hour, and even second to second. Well, thank you, Greg. I appreciate all, all these insights. Uh, I just want to mention that Atlantic White Shark Conservancy is, is a big sponsor for your work. Uh, so definitely visit AtlanticWhiteShark.org uh, and support any of their programming any of their outreach, especially during this time period. They're doing lots of our outreach via live stream like we're doing today. Uh, and Dr. Greg is actually going to be on their live stream on Thursday. So I'll definitely go on their Facebook and give it a watch. I'm sure there'll be a whole nother line of questioning there. Uh, speaking of questions, we're just going to take a few minutes to look through some of the questions that came along. And we will conclude our interview very shortly here. Um, Jennifer Thorne says hello. Um, Hi, Jen. <laughs> Jack's uh, age seven wants to tell you that he loves sharks. Um, how many shark's teeth do you have? <laughs> uh, I have hundreds of shark's teeth, actually, uh, because I've had, I've got some jaws, and um, from my early years of, of studying sharks, and mostly studying dead sharks. So I've got a whole bunch of jaws and each one of those jaws had a couple of hundred teeth in it. And of, of course, they're gonna ask you, what is your favorite shark? <laughs> you know, I'm somewhat of a fickle shark fan. It depends what I'm studying any given day. Um, I went through a phase where the blue shark was my favorite shark because I was doing my master's thesis. And then I kind of loved the Greenland shark because I did a bunch of Greenland shark work. and. And I, we've been tagging tigers lately in the Virgin Islands, and we've been tagging hammerheads in the Florida Keys, and I think they're really cool. But I have to admit, you know, still um, right now at the top of my list is the white shark just because we're learning so much and I'm spending so much time with them that they're still, you know, right up there. Of course, Brianna says hi. <laughs> hi, Brianna. <laughs> and a question from Beth. This year, how will social distancing affect your research? And when will you get back out on the water? Well, that's a great question. Uh, and believe me, I'm concerned about it. Um, you know, the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy is instrumental in supporting our research. Um, but if, you know, if they don't, you know, they need to raise the money in order for us to get a lot of it done. And, 
And so we got to see how that that plays out right now with everyone closed. And then, um, you know, we're hoping we don't get on the water really until mid to late June. So I'm hoping this cloud passes by then. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we always spend time on the boat fairly close to each other. And I hope I don't have to social distance on the boat because then I might end up being alone on it. And I don't want to be alone on that boat. I can't drive it and tag and do all those things at the same time. So I'm just praying that this, uh, this, this virus passes us by and we're able to go back to normal life. Not just me and, and other shark scientists, but all of you out there. You know, I, and I really appreciate what everyone's going through right now um, in order to stay safe and, and be well. Regina asks, what was your most memorable moment being on the pulpit? And what is your most disappointing moment on the pulpit? <laughs> well, my most memorable moment is probably, there's a famous video that uh, from a couple of years ago where a shark jumped up at me on the pulpit. And that um, that's my most memorable, even though it only lasted <laughs> about two seconds. It was my most memorable moment because I looked right down the the <laughs> The open mouth of a white shark, and I don't think I ever want to get that close to one again in that position. Um, and probably my, uh, probably my, the, the probably the worst time I ever had on the pulpit was if I would, it, you know, and it hasn't happened much, but every now and then we go to tag a shark and, it, and I miss, and so I, I don't like that. <laughs> and uh, that only happens every now and then, you know. Probably can't count it happening more than five times in my life but it's it's always disappointed when you don't you don't get the shark so um but we've been really lucky over the year and again you know i can't say enough about my team you know on that boat from megan to john king driving the boat wayne davis in the air you know and uh, and others it's just been you know incredibly productive bunch of years we were fortunate to have Wayne on our show here last week, a, a wonderful interview. And then we, we got to see some of his images and hear some of his theories about shark interactions. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. I hope we can do this again, Greg. Uh, this was great. I appreciate it very much. Uh, we're going to conclude the interview so you can get on with your, your next engagement. Thank and you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I wish... Uh, the Living Sharks Museum, a lot of luck. I come, to, I look forward to visiting when it's open again. I wish you all out there uh, the safest. Be well, be healthy. Thank you for, for watching. I hope I didn't bore you to death. And I look forward to seeing you all again. You take care. Thank you. Well, that's it, everybody. Thank you so much for coming by to listen to our interview here in the fighting chair. Every week we're bringing on someone new. We are very, very fortunate to have uh, legendary screenwriter Carl Gottlieb uh, this Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, the screenwriter of Jaws. Again, this is In the Fighting Chair. I'm your host, Keith Cowley from Living Sharks Museum. We hope you're all home, social distancing and safe, and we'll see you again here very soon. <laughs>